Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We are sh starting shortly. Let me move to our second annual lecture. Um, Friedrich von Wieser belongs to the, or is a towering figure of the second generation of the Austrian School of Economics, who produced, among other such scholars, such as a Nobel Prize laureate, F.A. Hayek. Friedrich von Wieser taught here in Prague for more than a decade before uh, actually leaving only in 1903 to take over Karl Menger's empty chair in Vienna. He will be always remembered by economists as the author of the concept of opportunity cost. Uh, I'm delighted today to introduce to you PCPE Wieser Memorial Prize recipient, Professor Bruno Frey. Uh, <laughs> Professor Bruno Frey teaches economics at the University of Zurich. He is an author of more than a dozen books and more than 350 articles in professional academic journals, including such outlets as the American Economic Review, Review of Economics and Statistics, Economic Journal, Journal of Economic Perspectives, Journal of Economic Literature, and Journal of Law and Economics. Uh, Professor Frey, a great theoretician of awards, please approach me to receive PCPE 2008 Visa Memorial Award for Excellence in Economic Education. It's a very great pleasure to be in Prague and to have been invited uh, to this uh, lecture. Happiness, everybody wants to be happy. And happiness researchers happily do their thing because it is the hot topic nowadays. That's probably the one field in economics where people work most today and I think also where the most interesting work is being done. Something is totally new for, for economists, namely, Happiness economists claim that utility can be measured. And people like Robbins, who was uh, cited uh, earlier today, he believed that utility cannot be measured. But, I mean, he lived in 1920 or something, and there is some progress over time. And that's one, namely, we can uh, measure utility by surveys and by several other ways to do that. Now, in this lecture, I want to emphasize the consequences of happiness research for uh, economic policy. Oh. <laughs> the dinner is the most important thing that will make you happy. Thanks. So the consequences uh, for policy. And the interesting thing is that those economists, many of those economists who do happiness research, now jump to the conclusion, wonderful, now we can measure utility, now the government should maximize the utility of the, the individuals. Imagine that. They now jump on this new insights in order to 
in my view, establish a very extreme kind of government interventionism or even uh, uh, something like a, a dictatorship. So I would like to convince you of three things in this lecture. The first is that happiness research is really very interesting. It does provide new insights compared to what we knew before. Secondly, I would like to convince you that government should definitely not maximize the utility of each of you or of anybody else. And the third thing I would like to uh, propose and to convince you of is that the government should choose the right institutions or the right constitution in order to enable people to find their own happiness in the way they want. So the constitution should be set and all the rest should be done uh, by the uh, individuals. Uh, and I propose two very practical institutions. The one is democracy, or rather direct democracy, and the second is decentralization of uh, political decision making. What do we know? What has happiness research told us? Namely, the first is that this picture is wrong. Uh, it's, of course, a beautiful picture by Van Gogh, but it suggests that people are unhappy all over. Wrong, totally wrong. We know that most people are surprisingly happy. On a scale from 1 to 10, there is practically nobody with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Only at 7, 8, and 9, people start to be Of course, 10 would be totally happy, but almost all people are in the range of between 6 and 8, somewhere, in between, somewhere there. And this morning, I had the chance to ask uh, the, the students of this university and to, to make a small survey, and exactly the same uh, result uh, came out, namely that even Czech students, imagine, even Czech people seem to be relatively happy. Namely, almost not, not exactly absolutely happy, though there was one person who was absolutely happy, uh, and I'm also absolutely happy, so too. Uh, and, 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 but all the rest was uh, very much skewed towards happiness. So, on the whole, we can be satisfied with what we find. Secondly, I think we have new insights concerning uh, some aspects of the economy. Do you remember the times when people said, there's voluntary unemployment? There is nothing like forced unemployment. It's a choice. You, you, you don't want to work for the money offered, uh, and then you are unemployment, employed, and that's free choice. Not true. People who lose their job, for any reason, who lose their job, so move from being employed to unemployed, get very unhappy, are deeply unhappy. It's the largest loss in happiness we can normally observe. This means that unemployment is a real problem. And why is it so terrible? It is so terrible because people feel thrown out of society. They have psychological problems because they, they feel they, are, they lose their competence. They are no longer regarded, highly regarded. Expected inflation. You remember the times when in all textbooks you read there are two types of inflation, expected inflation and unexpected, unexpected inflation. Expected inflation is no problem because you can redo the contracts. Well, no problem. It's 
It's only unexpected inflation which causes costs to people. Not true. We can't find that. We find that inflation overall uh, damages the happiness of people. The third thing, do income differences motivate? Of course, we, we think that the, the more un unequal the distribution is, the, more, the stronger are the incentives to work hard. However, that's only true for the United States, and moreover, for the wrong reasons. Europe, people dislike when the income distribution goes, uh, becomes more unequal. They really dislike it. And that's perhaps our past. We are used to think that uh, when some people earn more and, uh, and, and, and others less, that this is unfair. I don't say that this is so. I say that is the empirical evidence of what people in Europe think. Now, Americans seem to think differently. They say, when some people earn a lot of money, I have the chance to move up also. And it's great if I can move up a lot. Uh, however, Americans are wrong because upward mobility in the United States is not higher than in Europe. They, they believe it's higher. It's wrong. It's not higher. So they, they, they believe in something for the wrong uh, reasons. Uh, these are some uh, three examples of how happiness research changes our notions of, uh, of in the economy. Another notion is that economists thought that material things are crucially important. I show you, it's not true. Happiness research tells you that non-material aspects, such as caring for each other, are dramatically important. Now, that sounds all very sort of vague and weak, but I tell you, the results I, I, like, uh, I, I, I uh, bring here are based on the most advanced econometrics. It's, it's based on huge data sources. And on the whole, it's, uh, I think, uh, a good empirical evidence. So it's not just talking a little bit, uh, yeah, it's nice to, keep, uh, to care for each other, and then we are more happy. No, that's not the point. The point is that we have strong and I think convincing empirical evidence that, uh, that these effects are in, indeed true. Then ad uh, yeah. adaptation, very important. Uh, we are used to always look upwards. Uh, we adjust very quickly to new circumstances. And when you have a lot of win, your happiness goes up very strongly, but goes down also quite strongly again. And when you have a very heavy accident and uh, are, are, uh, must sit in the wheelchair, then your happiness, of course, goes down very strongly, but fortunately, it adjusts back, not totally to what was before, but it recovers. And I think that is a very uh, good thing. So adjustment, adaptation is very important, and that is an aspect we did not really take into account in uh, neoclassical uh, standard economics. Status orientation is, again, extremely important. Uh, you remember our, our models where we have uh, utility depends on income or utility depends on con consumption, on the consumption level. Not true. It depends on your consumption level and the consumption of other people. 
and you always compare uh, these two uh, things with each other. So that is another new uh, aspect. And that is a Ferrari, if you don't see it. <laughs> now, thing which every politician and every uh, nice person tells you, marriage makes you happy. I mean, look at that. <laughs> and it's even true. Look at that. Here we have point zero. That is when, the happy, uh, when uh, marriage takes place. So marriage is here. And we have data, uh, namely panel data, where we really trace the happiness of individual persons over time. So we can see what was the happiness level years before being married. So this chap or this, this lady didn't even know whom she is going to marry. She didn't know, she didn't know uh, wh whom she will even meet. So this happiness level here uh, is, uh, is not influenced by the consequent history. So we can say such a person has an average utility uh, happiness here. And then coming near to, uh, uh, to the date of marriage, uh, happiness dramatically increases, very strongly. You can see the difference, it's huge. And then it goes down again. <laughs> as strongly as before. <laughs> now, this is a little bit unfair because uh, it's lower than at the beginning. <laughs> that is not a general result. On the whole, married people are somewhat happier than non-married people. And of course, that's also a selection effect. When you consider who is not married, probably those in prison, uh, imbeciles, and <laughs> those in the military, people like that. So a little bit you know, not normal people, while normal people get married. Uh, and so it's also a selection effect. TV. TV is the most important activity in your life. That's an empirical statement again. Taken over your life from age two to age 92, People watch more TV than they work. Work is second, of second, secondary importance. TV is the most important thing uh, today. And uh, uh, the surprising thing is only that economics doesn't take that into account. When you look at, have you ever uh, attended a lecture on TV economics? Probably not, but you have attended dozens of lectures and dozens of courses on labor economics. And all these books and journal publications, labor economics, it's full of it. TV, no, no economists seemed to be interested. Now, I did this research together with my co-worker, Alois Stutzer, and uh, my, my uh, lady assistant, Frau Benesch. And actually, we wanted, of course, show TV, look at him, makes you unhappy. I mean, he's lying there. He doesn't look very, uh, very happy. Uh, he must have a beer to raise his happiness in the short run. <laughs> so uh, that's what we wanted to show. Uh, we had bad luck. We couldn't show it. TV seems to be quite good for some people, at least. Namely, and here comes opportunity cost into it, people who have low opportunity costs of time, they enjoy TV. So they don't know, know what to do else, and so TV is good for them. However, people like you, and perhaps even me, uh, who have opportunity costs of time, who could do something else, who could, who could go to the theater or, or uh, to, 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 to see a film or even to speak to one's wife or something, uh, they, they have high opportunity costs. And when s these people watch 
much TV. They get unhappy. I think that's a quite interesting result because it really shows how important the concept of opportunity cost is also in relation to uh, happiness. That is a, a funny result coming from an economist. Normally, economists wouldn't say, you know, give away money that is very rational and, and helping others is also good. Happiness theory tells you, happiness research, empirical research, tells you that this is indeed the case. When you give, the giver is happier. And the one who receives might also be happier. Uh, and uh, doing volunteering, uh, of course, there are two. There are two uh, aspects of volunteering. When uh, uh, it may be that happier people do more, more volunteering, but the other way is also true. People who do more volunteering are also happier. That's what we think we could establish. Then an interesting thing, people do make systematic errors in decisions. And that's a totally new aspect in economics because due to the approach we had, or we have, or, or a traditional standard theory has, which says people maximize their utility. They know what they do. Therefore, they don't make any uh, mistakes. Uh, revealed preference is the way economists have approached this problem. But now we find, because we can measure the utility of the people, their, their own reported happiness, we can show that people make some mistakes with respect to the past. They are, very, they are not very good in seeing how happy they were in the past. They're quite interesting. Uh, but what is, of course, more important is that there are systematic mispredictions about utility, the utility of goods in the future, systematic, not, not random errors. And we can now uh, say what this uh, is. It has to do with the differentiation between material and immaterial goods. In the case of material goods, people systematically overestimate the utility they will get from material goods. When you, when you buy this Ferrari, of course, uh, you think, because it's a great Italian car, uh, that you will enjoy it and that you, your happiness increases in the future when you drive around and all the girls, etc. However, when, when you really look at the uh, happiness of those people who do buy such things, it's much lower than they predicted themselves. And now the other way around, immaterial goods, the utility, the future utility, the future happiness, which brings you, which come from immaterial goods like personal relationships, friendships, uh, being together with relatives and things like that is uh, systematically underestimated. Because probably because it's difficult to, to think about, to imagine what does it mean to have a nice relationship, for instance, to have a friend with whom you can exchange ideas and drink good wine. I mean, you don't know him yet. And how can you imagine that this may bring you utility in the future? That is the reason, in my view, that the future utility of personal relationships are systematically underestimated. If this is true, that material goods, the, uh, the happiness of material goods is overestimated, of immaterial goods, underestimate. People probably work too much, probably. Uh, the life 
the work-life balance, the, the work-leisure balance is probably skewed due to this error. That's at least what uh, Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, the psychologist, uh, suggests. Then uh, I think that happiness research can also show you that uh, procedural utility, the utility you get from the process and not from the outcome is very important. Now, I know that, that people don't like that. Culture does not matter, because people like culture. However, we are able, I think, to show empirically that culture matters much less than most people think. Of course, in happiness, there are differences between countries. Uh, systematic differences. So the levels are different. Uh, if you ask an American whether he is happy, is there any? Oh, yes. He must say, ha, 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 yes, I'm happy. <laughs> if, you ask, if you ask a Czech, are you happy? He would say, huh? <laughs> happy? Oh, oh. Could, be, could be worse. Could be worse. <laughs> and, uh, and, the same, and the same with the Swiss. Now, my claim is not that these differences don't exist. You can, but you can pick that up with a constant in your equation. What I want to say with this is the marginal effect of those determinants of happiness are surprisingly equal between countries. For instance, when somebody is unemployed and, no, is employed and then moves into unemployment, Employment. So it becomes unemployed. Then the fall in utility, in, in happiness or life satisfaction, is very similar in most countries we have looked at. Not only uh, my, my research group, but many, many other researchers. And that is what I want to uh, emphasize here. Now, that is the most important thing, I think. Happiness research can tell you, can give you information on what basic institutions in society work well and which basic institutions do not work well. And here we concentrate on political institutions. Perhaps uh, uh, the first has to do with uh, democracy. It has been shown that the more, the better representative democracy uh, is, is, is in a country, the happier people are, all other things being equal. When I say all things being equal, that means in our research something like 30 other determinants are controlled for. So income and age and whatever you, you like, 30 other. We only vary the amount of a democracy. And what I did uh, with my co-worker, Alois Stutzer, we looked at direct democracy over Swiss cantons. We have 26 Swiss uh, cantons in Switzerland, and they have unequal de degrees of direct partic participation rights. And we were able to show that those with more direct democracy uh, participation rights in these, that in these uh, cantons people are happier. And how, how can we explain that? Uh, I think with two things. Uh, they are happier because government is better controlled with direct democracy. That is the first effect. So government works better. And the second effect is people like to participate in the political process and want to be heard. The second political institution which I find important is decentralization. Political decentralization by federalism, by federal structures as exist in uh, the United States and, and in very many other countries.
countries, but I do not think that it is very strong in the Czech Republic as far as I know. So federalism, a means that political decisions are taken on as much as possible on the local level, and people are happy if this is done. Now, what should we do about policy? We could discuss what possibilities there are at the micro level. You see that it does, uh, uh, that my uh, suggestion is that the government and researchers doing research on these uh, questions should inform or can inform people and that this should be discussed. So for instance, if people uh, really believe that buying uh, a Ferrari makes them much happier in the future, uh, I of course would not uh, prohibit buying a, a, a Ferrari nor would I uh, tax it very highly, but I would tell people, look, our evidence, our empirical evidence shows that it probably doesn't make uh, you happier, much happier than before, but go ahead if you like. I think information can work. Then on the macro level, I do think that governments should make a greater effort than up to now, to, uh, to, to try not to have any un, uh, uh, unemployment with the right policies, which very often mean uh, more, uh, more uh, better possibilities to move in and out of jobs. And of course, in many country, countries, it's almost impossible to dismiss people, therefore people are not hired. So there are a lot of possibilities for government to reduce unemployment, and I think one of the consequences of happiness research is, yes, let's do that, and inflation is relatively less important. Economic growth is probably not as important as uh, we many people think, uh, especially in rich countries. We know that when real income rises, People get adjusted very quickly. Uh, the magnitude is about if you have a rise in your real income, your happiness, of course, rises too, but two-thirds to three-quarters of the effect on happiness disappears already within uh, one year. So let's be somewhat critical about material economic uh, growth in our countries in the rich countries. But we know perfectly well that in poor countries, it's very important to raise real income because it really pushes up uh, happiness. Now, what are the approaches? One of the very new approaches is this new, new paternalism. I would like to go uh, into it for, for time reasons, but I don't particularly like this approach by, by uh, Thaler and, and others. And I think that the picture is nice, it's from The Economist. You know, the big government tells, tells the small uh, citizens that they should not make any uh, mistakes and they, that they should do the right thing to, to become happy. I, my question is, of course, why should the, the, the politicians and the public bureaucrats, first of all, really see what an individual makes happy? Uh, and secondly, why should they have an incentive to do that? Politicians have no incentive, generally, to raise happiness. They have a a strong incentive to be re-elected, which is not the same. What I would uh, think is the real important lesson from happiness research is that we should choose constitutions in the way of suggested by Buchanan, namely rules of the game, fixing rules of the game, 
where citizen particip participation decentralization play a large role. And uh, uh, you, you talked about uh, the prize winner, uh, talked about uh, Europe and the future of Europe. And if you see those two things and think of Europe, then you really get unhappy because this so-called new uh, constitution of Europe really disregards citizen participation. I mean, you are a member of the EU. You may uh, vote all four years for some chaps who afterwards sit in a parliament with 600 people. Could you imagine? Is that democracy with 600 people? Ridiculous. Uh, and no possibility for direct intervention by the citizen, except one very, very small possibility which leaves it to the parliament whether they uh, find uh, are good enough to take into account uh, the views of citizens. That's unfortunately the European Union, not on the taxation level, but on a, on a more political uh, level. And I think you, the Czech, should really push for more democracy in this, uh, in this European Union. Uh, the same applies to decentralization. Now, some of my colleagues who do happiness research think differently. They say, now we can measure utility. Now we can measure utility in terms of happiness. Now the government should come and do that. And the English government, uh, the former and the present one, is very strong on this. They want to do that. They say, now we have the uh, empirical basis to really maximize happiness. I would propose that there are several important objections to this. The first is from welfare economics. I, would I, I want to only emphasize this. Happiness is, in my view, not the only thing. There are other things which are equally important. And because we can now measure happiness, that doesn't mean that everything should now be concentrated, concentrated solely on happiness. Loyalty, responsibility, and freedom are also very important, and it's not the same as, as happiness. I readily concede that um, what I say is somewhat extreme because there are philosophers who, who believe that these things are included in happiness. But to me, it's something different. Now, objections from political economy, I think they are very important, namely, when government start maximizing happiness, it's really an extreme, the most extreme case of a benevolent dictator. Now, the, the people who like to tell the citizens what to do, now they can claim, we know how to do it, because we know what makes you happy. What, we, we then do not need any political processes. We don't need any discussion because we have here the nice results from happiness research. And I think that's totally wrong. And the citizens play no active role in such a government maximizing approach. They are just there to be asked, how happy are you? And then the government does all the rest. And that's certainly not what democratic politics is about. Then the, fall, uh, the third group of objections is that as soon as something is measured and becomes the object of politics, of policy, it will be distorted. It will be systematically distorted. Imagine if you were, if you were the, the British Prime Minister and you, you say, now I undertake a policy which makes you happy. And then 
Unfortunately, the results of the survey tells, tell you that uh, the English on, uh, are not so happy. What would you do? Of course, you would start to manipulate the data. All governments always do that. And uh, the Italians do it all the time, and they did it when they wanted to enter the Eurozone, and a lot of governments do that. You see, when, as long as the surveys on happiness are not used for policy, that doesn't happen. But as soon as it's used for policy, it's a totally different thing. And then, of course, the individuals start giving wrong answers or distorted answers. Imagine the following situation. You are a real right-winger. Yeah, probably you are. You are a real right-winger, and then, uh, but your government is left-wing. And then you are asked, how happy are you? And then, of course, you will say, oh, I'm very, very unhappy. Though, perhaps, in reality, you are happy. But you want to punish uh, this left-wing government. So you immediately have incentives to manipulate, even as, as a person uh, being asked. We have a lot of open is issues. Should we accept status desires, or shouldn't we? I don't know. Uh, what about adaptation? I have here a case. Uh, of legal compensation. Imagine the following. You are a judge, and there is a lady coming and a gentleman coming. And both have, uh, uh, were subject to the same accident. And the difference is that the lady has adjusted quickly to the accident, and the gentleman slowly. And when you only look at happiness, you would have to conclude that uh, the, the, the gentleman must be given a lot of compensation and the lady little compensation because he adjusts quickly. We know that such a situation is not an equilibrium because the, the lady will immediately start to say, oh, that's not true, I don't adjust so quickly, in order to get uh, uh, the same compensation as the, as the gentleman. So that is certainly an, a non uh, a situation which may not uh, uh, go on. Now, my conclusions. I think happiness research is really fascinating. We can do something with, uh, uh, with respect to policy. I wouldn't do... I, strong, I, I think there are real strong objections against this maximizing approach, which I think the French president is also a person who would like to do that, and he started already uh, inviting people to help him. What I think should be done on this basis is, uh, on the basis of happiness research, let's introduce uh, new institutions, additional institutions to make, to enable people, citizens to participate. And secondly, let's introduce more institutions to decentralize. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Uh, I know about it because I, I'm subject to it. Yes, that's, that's really nice, yeah. Uh, and in my case, this, the weakness of will has to do with TV because I like TV. I like to watch Western and, and military things and love stories and football and tennis, especially 
as long as our Federer wins, and, and things like that. And so I watch much too much. And, and the next, and I watch the whole evening, and the next day, I'm, no, at the end of the evening, I don't remember what I saw. And, and moreover, I'm totally angry about myself because I couldn't control myself. But the next evening, the same thing happens. So what did I, what can one do? You can throw out your TV set. That's the simple solution, and it works. Because then you have to find friends <laughs> where you can watch TV, uh, and that's somewhat more difficult. Another question, Professor Garello. Uh, the reason I didn't go into it was because this yeah. morning uh, I had a lecture on, on that. Uh, we, that can be done by representative surveys where you are asked, taken overall, how satisfied are you with the life you lead? And then people answer on a, on a scale from 1 to 10. And the answers, if you had told me that you, one can measure happiness with such a question, Ten years ago, I would have said, crazy. Today, I believe in it because it, the answers correlate very, very nicely with very important things. For instance, people who say they are happy laugh more, but not the American laugh. There's another one. <laughs> There's another one which is, I don't, know, I don't know the term, but it's in the eyes. You cannot fake it. Uh, happy people are more optimistic. Happy people are more forward-looking. Happy people are more sociable. Happy people commit less suicide and all these things. So it's not just a, a silly answer. It's, I think we can reasonably depend on it. Professor Di Lorenzo. Exactly. That is uh, what is always uh, said. I would answer that in economics we always use measures which are very bad. For instance, gross national product, national income. If you really look at it, it's ridiculous. I, I think I could destroy it in, in, half, in half a minute. But everybody accepts it. So I think what we measure here is certainly not ideal, certainly not, but it's reasonably good. And what we now do, of course, is not to rely only on surveys. You can also do brain scanning. Uh, you, you can, yeah, one thing uh, an English economist just found out, uh, I, feel that, I, I think that's rather nice, is that people with high blood pressure are less happy than those with low blood pressure. So one, one tries to look at evidence from many different uh, uh, directions. Christian Michel. Simple participating, which is which will 
boasts no self-esteem. The latter is probably even more important. And I was not uh, very precise, because it's not that voting makes you happy. It is the right to vote which makes you happy. The right. And very often, it is silly to go to vote, because sometimes the issues are just not important. And what, what, is really, what really matters is that the, the participation rate changes very strongly between unimportant and important uh, events. So it's the right to participate. Professor Garello, Jacques Garello. I think we can, uh, because the question is not, the question at least which I look at when I do econometric research is not, how happy are you? Rather, the question is, taken overall, how satisfied are you with the life you lead? And that is something much more deeper and, 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 and longer uh, run. But I, I would like to emphasize again, it's not an, an ideal measure, but it's much better than anything we had so far. Another question here. And speak up. Oh. <laughs> you would destroy all arguments of the economics of happiness. And mm -hmm. I felt myself happy. <laughs> At the end, when I understood that you are serious, I know I'm disappointed. So how would you comment from your perspective on happiness that there could change in my happiness? I mean, I can only say, if you are happy to be unhappy, that's your choice. <laughs> Still have a few minutes. Yeah, please go ahead. I, I rather uh, like to make a comment. Go ahead. I don't know anything about uh, the many wives, but I know something. Namely, there are many societies in which what, what I was talking about was romantic love leading to marriage. There is something quite different, namely arranged marriages, where love plays no role. And there, the development is exactly not that and going down. It's like that, slowly increasing over time. So at the point of marriage, uh, people who are in arranged marriages are not, not happier, but over in the long run, it's doing, they are doing reasonably well. One more comment or question. Is there something about voluntary giving? Yes. No, I haven't. I 
So I, I can't answer your, your question. I think it's an interesting question, but I, I have no answer. One last question. Sorry, I didn't. I couldn't hear you either. So, could you perhaps come over here clo a little bit closer or speak yes. up? Do you think that some spectrum is happening in the same field? No, they are different. Yes. You are right. Mm. Uh, you, cri you criticize me correctly. I was. The correct term is reported subjective well-being, but that's very clumsy. What we look at are the results of the question on life satisfaction. And then there are people working with happiness data, and happiness data are short run, are answers to the following question. How happy do you feel? And the answer is, of course, people then evaluate what's happening uh, just now. For instance, whether the light is good, then they are happy, uh, whatever. So uh, I think the better question to analyze the uh, issues I tried to, uh, to discuss uh, with you is the life satisfaction question. And uh, in, in, uh, in a serious, uh, I mean, in written, in the written discourse, I, of course, uh, differentiate things. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Frey, for your lecture and for the whole two weeks you've spent with us. Thank you a lot. <laughs> and now I'd like to uh, ask to come to the podium the Dean, Dr. Schwartz, to announce the and to announce the best scholarly papers thesis of four, sorry, of our students. Dr. Schwartz. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to announce that we have about twice more participants than we had last year. So let me announce the, and just ask the participants in the section of uh, economic theory and development of economic thinking. They are Petr Stepan, let me ask him just to come to, come to us here. Tomáš Veverka, Petr Houdek, Petr Vilimovský, Ondřej Jona, Katarina Zgutová. Come here, please, so we will submit you diplomas and participation lists. In the section of social system, let me ask three authors, Jakob Bohoněk, Jan Mali, Aleš Rod, to be ready. Then Petr Vlček, Tomáš Michalička, Michal Davidek, and Lenka Kupová. Jan Palguta, Petr Houdek, Marian Mindoš. The winner, the winner in the first section, Economic Theory and Development of Economic Thinking, is Petr Stepan. Second section, social system. So let me ask the people to come here. The names I read a minute before, a minute ago, to come here down. Uh, Sociální systémy my přidáváme, zase my dva. 
Petře, kde jsou ti lidé, aby tady přišli předávat? Proč tam stojí za rohem? No a proč tam stojíte za rohem? Nástup tady. No tak za, zavolej je. Nesmí se tu a zavolej je. Na, na čtu stojíte za rohem? Ježíš Marady to musí jít rychle, ti lidé se zvednou a odejdou. The winner in the section of uh, a seminary project, there are three. There is a joint paper by Jakub Bohoněk, Jan Mali and Aleš Roth. There they are. Pánové, vy jste první sekce, už můžete odejít, jo? Jo? To je strašně zorganizovaný teda. The, the winner in the section of Bachelor Project is Tomáš Michalička. Where he is? And the winner in the master project is Michal Davidek. The second section, the third section, economics, urban economics and economics of region and the law. We have four participants. Renata Chaloupková, Markéta Ulčová, Klára Kotásková, Stanislava Černovská. A kde je tady vítěz? Hele, kde je tady vítěz? Vítěz je tady The winner, the winner in this section is Eliška Borecká. Je tady? Four section, economic history. We have the following participants. Hanna Rumíškova, Tomáš Kalinec. Jakub Dietrich. Tomáš Engelmayer. Jakub Haas, Jan Palguta, Zdeněk Pavlík, Dušan Ružík, Matěj Kováč, Ludmila Svatošová, Jaroslav Žulavský, Jakub Novotný. The winner in The, yeah, the, the best master project is by Tomáš Kalinec. A tohle? Yeah. And the best seminary paper is by Tomáš Rumíškova. Economic policy. The participants were Pavol Minárik, Petr Fiala, Kateřina Štěpánková, Zdeněk Sejček, Daniela Štemberová, Michal Procházka, Michal Rázek. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. The winner in the uh, the best seminary paper is by Pavel Minarik. The best bachelor project is by Petr Fiala.
And the best master project is by Kateřina Štěpánková. She's not present. And we have a special prize here. Um, the prize dedicated by the head of department of economic policy that is for Daniela Štemberová. Uh, environmental economics. The participants were Nikola Klemová, Jana Bílková, Jiří Louda, Petra Zíková, Jiří Vaněk, Alena Kováčová, Kateřina Krpatová, Zuzana Bodková, jsem četl. Anna Kroutilová a Ivana Kuličková. The best seminary paper is by Jiří Louda. Není. It's not present. Best bachelor project by Jana Bílková. and the best master project by Nikola Klemová. So we are ready, aren't we? So thank you. Congratulations to winners and thank to all participants. So I am quite sure that they will have profit from, from the research they have already done, they have something, they can continue on that, and so I'm quite sure that they will be very successful with their master project. So thank you very much, and so let me just to give a mic to Joseph. All right, last but not least, uh, our um, annual special prize called after Professor Gary Becker, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to ask Miroslav Zajicek to come to the podium and award the best students winning the Gary Becker Prize. Okay, it's my pleasure to announce uh, the 13th uh, annual competition, uh, the Gary Becker Prize in Economic Science. Uh, for students, not only from the University of Economics, but also for, for students for from other economic schools, theoretically from all over the world, but technically uh, it never happened that any other participant, but yeah, it happened, even a winner was from Slovakia, but I still take Slovakia from, for a part of the Czech Republic. So uh, let's start to announce the winners. So let's start with, with the first prize, and the winner for this year is Michal Prochaska. Uh, Michal uh, did an interesting job in uh, empirical work on the Czech drug market, so Gary Becker would really like to uh, hear or maybe read this, this paper. Um. The second uh, was Petr Hodek. And the special prize is for Andre Onak. Winners will not receive not only books and diplomas, but also some uh, monetary uh, prizes that they will arrive to their bank accounts in, year, in days to come. 
Thank you for all participants and congratulations to winners. Thank you. This is unfortunately all for today, so I thank you all for participating. Just let me remind you a few things. Uh, you still can join us to go to a dinner together. There are still voucher, vouchers for dinners available at the, at the registration desk. So please, if you have not bought it yet, it is still possible. Um, second, please remember that there is the journal uh, New Perspectives on Political Economy, which is ready to publish your papers. Uh, both uh, those presented here or it's open to any other submissions. As I said, we have started four or three years ago and have already published more than 1,000 pages. Anything which fits the overall objective of ours, which is to show how beautiful economic science is when defined broadly. So cross-disciplinary research, non-technical papers, uh, papers uh, trying to enrich economics from whatever field, be it history, political science, sociology, and vice versa. Uh, you all know that tomorrow we are starting sessions at 8.30. In this building, uh, starting at 8 o'clock, there will be a small refreshment, coffee uh, available. And uh, there are sessions throughout the whole day till the evening. And lunch for those who paid here at the university. Uh, dinner, once again, outside below the Prague Castle, so if the weather is nice, we can have a very nice evening walking together up the hill to, to see the Prague Castle. Um, and as you all know, there is a short session on Sunday morning, not here, but at the Librani Institute it's in downtown Prague, not far from National Theatre. You have all little maps in your handbooks, so uh, if you want to discuss the role of think tanks in Europe, uh, feel free to, to join us. So I wish you a wonderful evening and I hope we will together enjoy the conference. Thank you for coming.